Can an organ speak? Or a tissue? Or even a single cell? Just like we do. Speech is arguably the most important form of communication we humans use to convey our feelings and thoughts to others. Speech is so important for us that we have modified a part of our upper airways to be able to make more complex sounds. On the downside, this modified part can now not do its original job anymore, namely keeping things from falling back into our lungs. So while we humans gained the ability to talk a lot or even sing, we also can and do choke. But if speech and communication are already important enough for the relatively loose communities of people to embrace the risk of choking and dying, how much more important must it be for the tight communities of cells? Indeed, cells talk to one another, they communicate with one another all the time to run the show of life. So let me ask again, and I think by now you know the answer. Can an organ, or a tissue, or a single cell speak? If they do speak and say that we are careful or silent enough to hear them talking, do we actually understand their language? Or why would we even bother listening to yet another living thing talking? But imagine, wouldn't it be handy if you can hear your body warning you as soon as the number of red blood cells in your blood starts decreasing, before you actually start feeling sick, before you go and see a doctor to hear that there's something fatally wrong with you, and exactly at the right time for treatment? Or what if, if you can hear your muscles talking to you, complaining that you're using them too hard during running or exercise, before you have to live with the outcome? That is the pain that will maybe remain at your joints, at your muscles, for years. How do we detect diseases before they impair us? How can we put a microphone out there and hear what the cells are talking about? How can we detect and understand when something is wrong with them? These are the questions that I try to answer as a scientist and a device engineer. And I decided thinking about these questions when I was at graduate school. Obviously, not out of the blue. Firstly, because they concerned my PhD topic. I was trying to understand the behavior of a particular class of polymers, and my aim was to make a tissue paper out of them. Making a napkin probably doesn't strike you as a topic worth doing a PhD about. But this tissue paper was something special. When you sneeze on it, it could tell you whether you have a viral or bacterial infection, so that every time when you start sneezing a lot, you don't think about taking antibiotics. A tissue paper that is made of special polymers, which would change their color, depending on the type of infection that your mucus carries. Because we don't see such tissue papers out in the pharmacies yet, you may guess that my talk today will be about something different. While I was working on this napkin biosensors in a country far away from the one that I was born in, back home, my mother was fighting with a progressive disease. A disease that was slowly melting down her joints. And I need to tell you that it was absolutely horrible to see a very energetic, active person being stuck on her chair, not being able to live life as she used to. The doctors told her that she must have had the symptoms years ago. And what got stuck with me was when they said, if she was diagnosed back then, there were treatments that could have helped her. But now, after all those years, at this stage, it was simply too late. So most of the times, what we are going to suffer from when we are old has an onset. It already starts when we are much younger. We just do not see the warning signs on time. 
or we cannot go and see a doctor every time a symptom appears to figure out what it might actually mean, right? That means living life in a paranoid state. We also cannot carry a doctor in our pockets just as we carry our smartphones, at least not yet. So during my PhD period, my graduate studies, I was mostly frustrated. I need to admit, I was a frustrated person. I was frustrated firstly because I didn't listen to my mom and study medicine, so I didn't become a real doctor who could diagnose diseases. Secondly, my biosensor project was not the breakthrough that I hoped for, although I learned a lot from my wonderful mentor and the members of my group. So during my PhD period, with lots of ups and downs, I could not develop a sensor for influenza virus. But a good dose of frustration blossomed into motivation. And with that motivation, I moved on to different concepts. I continued my training as a postdoctoral researcher to find new ways to build biosensors. Now, remembering Winston Churchill, success, or whatever you call it, is going from failure to failure without losing your enthusiasm. And I never seem to lose mine, ever. But do not get me wrong. From the way how I'm telling this story to you and my dedication to build biosensors, you may think that my career path was perfectly carved and it was all smooth and all I wanted to do as a child to become an engineer and develop devices that could diagnose diseases. If you asked me back then, I probably didn't even know what a sensor was. Moreover, as a child or teenager, as far as I can remember, I never had an ambition to become someone or something. But there was one thing that was maybe a little bit special about me. When I was three years old, I could read and write in three languages. And as I turned five, I started solving linear algebra problems. I wish that it's true, but it's not. <laughs> Obviously not. I was not a child like that, and I could never be. All I had was a spark of curiosity and a sense of responsibility. Responsibility such that I would not go out and play with my friends or even eat my meal, my dinner, before I finish my homework. Curiosity such that when I had my headphones on, I would not stop listening to a song until I managed to disentangle the sounds of all the disparate instruments and sometimes find the right tune with my guitar. Similarly fascinated and curious about the polymers and the plastics that are all around us, I decided to get a degree in textile engineering. I learned how to make fibers and yarns from polymers and make clothes cheaper and sometimes smarter. But when I decided to get to graduate school, Instead of learning more about what I already know, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to use my engineering skills to solve seemingly unrelated problems. And that was the right call. Because if I hadn't moved away from the strictly marked borders of my own discipline and entered new zones, I would have probably never found out about the materials, the polymers, that are at the core of my research and my devices today. But how do we get the courage to do this? Of course, moving into a new scientific discipline and to dare solving problems that may seem bigger than you or unrelated to you sounds scary. You don't need to be a genius to do so. You don't have to be the child who could solve linear algebra problems at the age of five. But there are two things one needs to do. When moving out of the comfort zone, the first thing, the very first thing you commit to is hard work. One needs to work hard, like a honeybee. Honeybees are remarkable insects. A honeybee continuously collects honey from different flowers and combines them to make a remarkable one original recipe. And she does that without losing a pinch of enthusiasm. 
doesn't care if there's too much sun outside, like here, or a lot of rain. She just carries on and, and looks around. When you work hard with a well-laid plan, you will realize that there's time for everything else. And it's indeed that everything else outside your own work that is going to make your mind richer. The more open you are to the world around you, the more diverse your interests are going to get, and you will find more toys to play with. And those toys are going to diversify your mind and allow you to think about a problem from different angles, different perspectives. Now, talking about differences brings me to the second most important rule of moving out of the comfort zone. Will you guess that? It is respect for others. No matter what our professions are, or how good or successful we are at what we are doing, it is very likely that someone out there has a better way of doing it. And this person can be an expert in something vastly different, but you will not know this until you respect for that other voice and think about the problems that you face more as common issues. Because in the end, we all have very similar problems. doesn't matter what the profession or the fields are. So, believe in the power of different voices. Those voices may first seem to confuse you and sometimes maybe embarrass you, but they're also the source for those different honeys to make your own remarkable original recipe. Well, how do I know all of this? Right? After my PhD training, during my postdoctoral period, I was naturally immersed in such an environment with different voices. Without even realizing it, I was learning something new each day, simply by working side by side with people who haven't studied anything close to what I did. And I was just learning something new from them, completely new things. And at the end of my training, something happened. It became crystal clear to me that big problems and their solutions required decidedly an interdisciplinary environment, and such an environment must be created as it does not emerge by itself. So what we need to do is bringing the voices of those different disciplines together. We need to be able to work together. For me, interdisciplinary research is a natural outcome of myself moving out of my comfort zone. It's a process of conceptual breakthrough, but most importantly, collective thinking. Only when you work hard, but with an ear open to others, you will be able to move out of your comfort zone and there solving big problems. Now, here I am today sharing with you the story of how I, as a textile engineer, move out of my comfort zone to design biosensors. My team and I develop bioelectronic devices that can hear the sound of our body and translate these sounds into a language that we humans can understand. And these voices can come from anywhere, from the cells that are at our fingertips to the ones deep inside the brain. To hear the cells talking, we engineer very special polymeric materials and apply them in tiny electronic devices. These polymers are electrically conducting, they are friendly to cells, and some of them have pretty good ears. Now, one of the preliminary works that came out of my lab is this paper-based glucose sensor. Now, this device is made on a paper, like an A4 paper, it is made fabricated using a printing technology, which is very easy, and it uses only polymers with different functionalities. But most importantly, it listens to your saliva. This time, when you spit on it, it can tell you whether your saliva contains a high amount of sugar, and if that's the case, it recommends you to go and see a doctor for a more comprehensive checkup. Now, I and many others believe that these devices will revolutionize the way how we receive healthcare. And we believe that these disposable sensors can be an alternative for those who do not want to prick their fingers uh, to withdraw blood 
while surviving with diseases like diabetes. Now, my goal is to engineer these polymers, make them more functional, so that they detect things other than sugar, such as markers of diseases like cancer, or symptoms of progressive diseases, like my mother has. In the future, these devices will be much more efficient. They will be even smaller, so that they will be attached to our clothes or to our bodies, either outside or inside. So they will be there watching our back without even us realizing it. Even though it's one out of 100 devices that you develop, it's promising. The very idea that something that you draw in a piece of paper, then you go to the lab, you, you make it, you fabricate it, you test it, and this device has the potential to become one day the treatment of millions of people's health problems worldwide is what wakes me up every single day. And what does not let me sleep are those 99 devices that have failed. Not because I feel angry or, or discouraged, but sometimes you just want the morning to come so that you can finally start your day and do something about it. It is my responsibility to wake up to a day where we can make that single device work. And believe me, if that day is not today, it will be tomorrow. If it is not tomorrow, there will be yet another one. So, if you want to move out of your comfort zone, but do not think that you have the genius genes to do so, I suggest you just go ahead and see how you will surprise yourself. But work hard, like a honeybee. And be curious, and most importantly, hear and see what people from other disciplines, backgrounds, are going to add to your recipe. Life is really too short, and we all have a lot to contribute. Let's just not stay comfortably stuck in one zone, shall we? Thank you.